Good morning. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Good morning, Rick and Connie, Susan. Susan, good to have you back. I hope you've enjoyed your vacation. Um, good morning, Peggy and Teresa and Bobby. Um, it's good to see you guys. All right. Um, I know on Teresa's morning devotion, she said, if today is, if you're a cold person, you like the cold, the cold outside, then this is your day. And Yesterday was her day. She likes the warmth. I kind of like the I like the cooler temperatures. Not cold, but just cooler. So I guess today is my day, Teresa. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Stacy. Um, it's so good to see everybody. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. And um, we are on day 321 in Lion Bites. Good morning, Joe and Charlene. Good to see you guys. All right, so today's uh, title of this um, Lion Bites passage is Seek My Kingdom. And it says, but first and most importantly, seek, aim at, or strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. And that's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 in the Amplified Bible. Come back to this to this scripture. Come back to this truth. It is a foundational passage that gives you a key for kingdom living. It's a scripture that requires you to plumb the depth of it, to study it, and discuss it with my spirit. It requires that you come and know me. Ask me what makes up my character. What attitudes do I have? Who am I? How does my kingdom reflect what I value? Many have learned about me or have pursued what they thought was my kingdom, yet they wrongly pursued man's idea of me. They wrongly pursued ideas of my kingdom, and they have wasted their lives in striving and in doing good works because they didn't know me. Do not fall for the same trap that they have. I desire to teach you who I am, to show you my values, and to instruct you on kingdom living. Learn from me. It's time to explore my kingdom, and that begins by first knowing me, the king. You will never be satisfied with anyone else except for me. You will never find fulfillment in striving after anything else but my kingdom. Get the first things first. Until you do, you will always feel that there is an emptiness and a void. I created you with a void, a hunger, a deep well within that can only be satisfied by me. So here's our action for today. Here are some ideas to help us. 
Read the story of Mary and Martha as it shows a great picture of who had her priorities in order. Read scriptures with the phrases, the kingdom of heaven is like. What do these scriptures teach you about the kingdom? Ask the Lord to give you a revelation of where your concept of kingdom doesn't line up with his. Ask him to show you how to start to align your life with the kingdom. So I want to go back up here um, where it talked about uh, people who have wasted their lives in striving and in doing good works because they didn't know me. And it says, do not fall for the same trap as they have. I desire to teach you who I am, to show you my values, and to instruct you on kingdom living. Learn from me. So let me let me talk a little bit about that because um, I sometimes, I, I realize that sometimes our works, the things that we do, that's, that is a form of worship. It's a very important part of our walk with the Lord. But I think sometimes, especially if, if you're like me, where you like to see some progress, you know, um, it's harder to measure the growth, for example, when it's an inner growth that's going on. Sometimes we don't even see it. My friend Teresa and I, we talk often and I won't see something in me, but she will see it. She will say, oh, look how you've grown. And I always appreciate her saying that because um, I don't always see it. I'm with myself all the time. So those are kind of hard to gauge sometimes. Other people may see it, but sometimes we don't see it until it's brought to our attention. But when we go out and we feed the hungry or we, you know, help help do something in the neighborhood or, you know, um, we go and build a ramp for somebody who's elderly and who needs that on their home or whatever it is, then we can stand back and we can feel satisfied. But anybody can do those acts. Anybody, an atheist can do those acts. What's important is what's in our heart. And that we're doing it for the right reason because we're doing it because we want to help somebody. We we love them and we want to just show their value. We want we want to make things a little bit easier for them. We want to help them. And it's all in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not in the name of Shannon or in the name of my neighbor over here or whatever. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do what we do. And when we have that personal relationship with him, then when we do those things, it just comes naturally. But there are some people who who like, okay, we're gonna organize this and we're gonna go do this and then, but they don't they don't really have it in their heart. It's really more about making themselves look good or feeling good. You know, they're they're about that um that that um feeling that comes from doing good or whatever it might be. And so I think it's just really important that we, as we do our self-examinations that we do, we're supposed to do daily where we think back upon the day and we think back upon who we might have offended so we can go and make amends or, you know, do we have our side of the road clean? Um, you know, all of those things, then this is, this is part of it is what is our heart. And when our, when we say our prayers, we can ask God, God, search my heart show me anything that's there that is not um, righteous and holy. Show me where pride and ego and and self-satisfaction and self-promotion come in the way and, and, and rid me of those things and help me to be doing what I'm doing for the sake of the kingdom of God instead of for myself. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a, a really important thing to remember because it's real easy. At least it is for me. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself that it's real easy to get caught up in those feelings. Um, when that's not what it's about at all. It's really about being about the kingdom business. Oh Lord, let our souls rise up to meet you just as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the father, to the son and to the Holy spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen and amen. All right, so our first reading today is in Joshua chapter 24, and we are starting in verse 1. And this is titled, The Lord's Covenant Renewed. When Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Sheshem, including their leaders, leader, the elders, leaders, judges, and officers, so they came and they presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and, and 
Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates River. They worshipped other gods, but I took your ancestors Abram, Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates, led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt, and afterward I brought you out as a free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioteers. And when the ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes you saw what I did, and then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I gave you victory over them, and I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land that you had not worked on, and I gave you towns that you did not build. The towns where you are now living gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer gods of your ancestors? Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Um, I absolutely love that passage. It is one of my favorites. Um, because in that in that passage, um, it talks about all of the things that they got, not because of their own ability, not because they were deserving of it, but because God loved them, because God gave them, because God's a provider, God's a protector, God is the sustainer. And um, and so he gave them all of these things um, just simply because he loves them, because he wanted to take care of them. And so as we think back over all of the things that God has given us, do we take credit for that? Do we say, oh, I've worked really hard and now I've got this really great bank account and I'm going to be re able to retire and I'm going to be able to travel the world and, and just enjoy life? Or do we say, I am one blessed person because I have all of this and it's not because of my efforts or because I am so great. It's because of the one who lives in me. He is so great. He is the one who has given me the ability to think. He's given me a good business sense. He's given me um, the ability to be faithful and to be consistent. He's the one who has given me the ability to control my tongue all those years that allowed me to keep my job or whatever it might be. God is the one that gives us all of those things. And so this morning we praise him for that, right? And we and when we read this, we say, because he has done those things for me, because he continues to help me beyond what I can do, then as for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. Amen. All right, our next passage is in 2 Chronicles. And we're in chapter two, starting in verse one today. And um, we are going to uh, be talking about preparations for building the temple. Remember that um, Second Chronicles is about Solomon and the kings that came after him. 
And um, so remember, he was tasked with building the temple. David wanted to build it, but God said, no, it's not going to be you because of the blood you have on your hands. Instead, it's going to be your son, Solomon. So here we go. Solomon decided to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord and also a royal palace for himself. He enlisted a force of 70,000 laborers and 80,000 men to quarry stone in the hill country and 3,600 foremen. Solomon also sent this message to King Hiram of Tyre. Send me cedar logs as you did for my father David when he was building his palace. I am about to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God, and it will be a place set apart to burn fragrant incense before him, to display the special sacrificial bread, and to sacrifice burnt offerings each morning and evening on the Sabbath at noon at new moon celebrations and at the other appointed festivals of our Lord, of the Lord, our God. He has commanded Israel to do these things forever. And this must be a magnificent temple because our God is greater than all the other gods. But who can really build him a worthy home? Not even the highest heavens can contain him. So who am I to consider building a temple for him except as a place to burn sacrifices to him? So send me a master craftsman who can work with gold, silver, bronze, and iron, as well as with purple, scarlet, and blue cloth. He must be a skilled engraver who can work with the craftsmen of Judah and Jerusalem who were selected by my father David. Also send me a cedar, cypress, and red sandalwood logs from Lebanon, for I know that your men are without equal at cutting timber in Lebanon. I will send my men to help them an immense amount of timber will be needed for the temple I am going to build will be very large and magnificent. In payment for your woodcutters, I will send 100,000 bushels of crushed wheat and 100,000 bushels of barley and 110,000 gallons of wine and 110,000 uh, gallons of olive oil. All right, so as you probably noticed, there were um, multiple things lifted, listed here that were going to be part of the temple. This was what he was being asked. Um, he was he was asking for these provisions. Solomon was, and um, you'll notice that he it was nothing but the best. It says here gold, silver, bronze, and iron as well as the purple, scarlet, and blue cloth. Those were the richer cloths, the ones that were um, of more value. He talked about um, the wood of Lebanon, the logs from Lebanon, the cedar and the cypress, the red sandalwood, the the um, wood from Lebanon, from what I understand, was the was the best. Um, and, and it was going to be nothing but the best for the Lord. And so he was asking for the finest materials. Now, do we have that same attitude? Um, I have asked this several times in the last few weeks. Um, do we have this same attitude towards God? Are we giving him our very best or are we giving him what's left over of our resources, of our time, of our energy, of our creative mind? Um, you know, whatever it might be. So just something to think about as we um, do that examination and we ask God to search our hearts. Perhaps that's part of it as well. You know, Lord, you know, search our hearts and, and give us the courage to give you the very best. If we don't, if we, if we feel like we can't, we're so full of fear or whatever, um, you know, we can ask God for help in that. All right. And then our last passage today is in Ezekiel chapter 41. And it says, this is in starting in verse one. And it says, after that, the man brought me into the sanctuary of the temple and he measured the wall on either side of its doors and they were 10 and a half feet thick. The doorway was 17 and a half feet wide and the walls on each side of it were eight and three quarter feet long. The sanctuary itself was 70 feet long and 35 feet wide. And then he went beyond the sanctuary into the inner room and he measured the walls on either side of the entrance and they were three and a half feet thick. The entrance was 10 and a half feet wide and the walls on each side of the entrance were 12 and one fourth feet long. The inner room of the sanctuary was 35 feet long, 35 feet wide. This, he told me, is the most holy place. 
and then he measured the walls of the temple and it was ten and a half feet thick there was a row of rooms along the outside edge each room was seven feet wide these side rooms were built in three levels one above the other with thirty rooms on each level the supports for these side rooms rested on exterior ledges on the temple wall they did not extend into the wall each level was wider than the one below it corresponding to the narrowing of the temple wall as it rose higher a stairway led up from the bottom level through the middle level to the top level i saw that the temple was built on a terrace which provided a foundation for the side rooms this terrace, terrace was ten and a half feet high the outer wall on the temple's room was eight and three quarter feet thick this left an, uh, an open area between these side rooms and the rows of the rooms along the outer wall of the inner courtyard this open area was 35 feet wide and it went all the way around the temple two doors opened from the side room into the terrace yard which was eight and three quarters feet wide and one door faced north and the other faced south all right so the um verse that i want to point out is verse four and in verse four it talks about um the inner room of the sanctuary was 35 feet long and 35 feet wide this he told me is the most holy place so as you're imagining and i know it's kind of hard probably to imagine um this temple being built but um and and all of the measurements i know are just they're boring as they can be and i just own that but um there's some reason why they're they're put here and um i think that we pay attention to that we say okay well maybe it's because god gives us every detail he gives us everything that we need if we're listening and we're if we're um if we're asking him sometimes you know he only gives us just enough light for the step that we're on because he needs us to trust him because what um is ahead may be too scary but that's a side note all right so what i want to mention here is that the inner room in the very center of this temple is the place where the most holy will be and that is really important when we think about the fact that it is our heart this is the center of who we are um and and um you know once our heart once our physical heart stops beating we completely pass away and and, and when we uh drift away from the lord when 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 um we push him out of our heart then we also begin to face a spiritual death because we become the god of our lives and um we we can uh, make a mess of that pretty quickly and we can find just how powerless we really are um, which is not a bad thing to discover how powerless we are. That's a good thing. But um, sometimes it's a very painful process getting to that point um, when we can just allow God to be at the center of our lives and and he be the most holy and he be the one who, who guides our lives and we submit ourselves to him and we do what he, what he asks us to do. And that is the optimal life um, where we experience the most blessings. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and um, I just I just want to um, offer up um, whatever God lays on our hearts today, and I just want to encourage you to to pray whatever prayers may come to your mind as well. Susan asked that we pray for the family of um, Terry Halloran. I'm hoping I'm saying that right, Halloran. Um, this is a friend of hers who passed away saturday from cancer so i'm so sorry susan for your loss and we will definitely be praying for her family most gracious heavenly father we praise you today we thank you for the the messages that you have given us the multiple messages that you have given us today we pray lord first of all that we will seek you in all that we do that we will put you first, that we will recognize that any effort that is outside of you is just mere energy being wasted. Um, it's not that there can't be good results that come from it, but it, 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 if it's done with the wrong motives, if it's done for self-satisfaction or, or um, for promotion, then it is not a godly thing. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us as we go throughout our day to um, bring every thought captive to you, 
um, to your mind. May we, may we be seeking what you would have us do. May we seek the right motives and may we seek um, the right results. Um, and, and, and realizing that sometimes the results don't happen as we would like them to, but Lord, we know that you're in charge and we know that sometimes it's, they happen because it's what's best. And so father, I just pray today that we will be accepting of what's best in your eyes. And I pray Lord, that you will help us to be faithful, to follow you every step of the way. I pray Lord, that, that you will be at the center of our heart. And I pray, Lord, that that will be evident to all that we meet today. May they experience your light and love through our actions, through our words, through the things that we do, not because we uh, have to, but because we want to, because we want to glorify you in all that we do. We pray today, Lord, for um, the Halloran family, we pray, Lord, that you will be with them and that you will comfort them during this time. We pray uh, for Susan as well as, as this was a friend of hers. We pray, Lord, that you will bring comfort and, and you will bring um, that sense of, of being held by you and, and that they will be loved by their friends and family around them. I pray, Lord, also that you will be with those today who will need phys physical healing emotional healing, spiritual healing. We pray, Lord, that your hands will be upon each one of us and our family members and our friends that we lift up to you this morning. And we give you praise because we know that you are working in the midst of all of it. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, convict us of the need for spiritual disciplines that call us to stillness, centeredness, and contemplation. Remind us that your word is living and present to nurture us, grow us, and sustain us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may lead you today. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he will show you. May he bring you home rejoicing right back here in the morning. Everyone have a great Wednesday, and I will see you soon. I love you guys. Bye.